Well, good afternoon. Is everybody comfortable? This presentation is called Falling into the Arms of Phoebe, or it's also called Sanapa Sizes 1949. You'll see the reason for the two names uh, a little later on. Um, my name is uh, Peter Roscoe, and I'm one of the people who has helped organise the History Festival uh, over this weekend. Um, the presentation is based primarily on uh, local newspaper stories and uh, conversations I've had with local elderly gay men. Uh, I hasten to add that I'm not a historian uh, or an academic. Um, I've put this together because it's a story I discovered uh, actually some 15 years ago and I just think it's a really interesting story and it unfolds the more work I do on it. Uh, just to quickly add, um, although this presentation focuses on the situation uh, that applied to a number of gay men in Shrewsbury back in 1949, it doesn't mean that um, women uh, were of no consequence in this story or that the situation for lesbians was not dire. It also was. But um, if you've been to the talk by Jane Trace, I would recommend that to you because she uh, really covers just that situation so very well. So, uh, 1949 in Shrewsbury, what was going on? Well, like uh, elsewhere in post-war Britain, there was rationing, um, although that had come off clothing uh, the year before, in 1948. Uh, there, was a, there was national service, um, still compulsory. One of the older gay men I spoke to was posted to Kidderminster. Um, there was a wonderful new National Health Service, and two of the men in this story worked for it. And uh, the, Royal the Royal Shrewsbury Infirmary and the nursing home were, back in 1949, just behind St Mary's Church. Some of you probably know it. There were also nationalised railways, no um, private companies running the show. And one of the uh, men in the story worked as a railway farmer at Shrewsbury Station. And uh, just out of interest, the direct train to London in those days was to Paddington, not Euston. Now, what was happening specifically in Shrewsbury? Well, there'd been a, a royal show planned, attended by Her Royal Highness Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Um, the Granada um, Theatre opposite the station was putting on amazing shows with some very big names, um, staying at the very posh Raven Hotel, which is where Woolworths now, uh, where Woolworths used to be, I should say. Huh? Um, yes, I know, it's going too fast, isn't it? Um, there were new council housing going up, uh, uh, the, the, the flats that... Um, George lived in, in Copthorne, would have been a, a, a new property then, built probably in 1948. And there was a new constable called Douglas Osmond, new chief constable of police. What was life like for gay men in 1949? Um, I'm using the word gay, although generally I think people would have probably either said queer or homosexual, um, might have just said words like, oh, they're so, or like that. And the word gay was used, we've discovered from the letters uh, in the um, Oswestry story, The Soldiers in Love, which is a presentation later. Uh, in the letters, they do use the word gay occasionally, which I found quite interesting because I thought it didn't come into the UK until much later. Um, and how many um, gay men were there in Shrewsbury in 1949? Well, probably about the same number as today. It's impossible with these statistics, but I just go with the, when the government brought in civil partnership, they tried to work out how much it would cost, and they pitched the percentage at 8% of the population being lesbian or gay in terms of the costing. So let's go with 8%. So 8% of the town is, is, is gay men. What lives were they living? Well. I think for most of them, they lived in a very peculiar state because there was such tremendous stigma and such huge fear of being identified as queer um, that they were living secret lives. Um, one of the older chaps I spoke to said, well, really you grew up um, to learn how to lie. You spent most of your life telling lies to people uh, because you could not risk disclosure. And I'll go into 
why there was that fear and stigma just in a moment. How did gay men meet up in 1949? I mean, it's bad enough now, um, even with Grindr and all the rest of it, but how did you meet up to actually make a friendship, make, make a relationship? Well, a number of places. This is a photograph of the Smithfield Market, and the older guys tell me that the cottage, the public toilet there, was very popular. Um, the market used to be in Smithfield Road, uh, now where the Premier Inn is. It was a huge site, and that was a one meeting place. Otherwise, there were, at the time I've heard, two bars or pubs you could go to. One was the Old Three Fishes, which is uh, just on the right-hand side there in the picture. You probably recognise it. Um, that picture may be a little bit earlier than 1949, as you can tell by the car that's in the street there. Um, and there was also the, the bar as you go into the Lion Hotel on Wild Cop. Um, but again, one of the guys said that was fine so long as you were extremely discreet. And it's an interesting thing with Shrewsbury. There was never an established um, pub or bar. Um, we moved from place to place because as we were not tolerated or somebody was too indiscreet, then we would no longer be welcome and off we would have to go. Another possibility was contact magazines, health and strength. Um, guys would advertise in this magazine and I'm told that the trick was if you put after your advert, say you were interested in walking or cycling or whatever, you would put uh, men only, please reply. Um, that was one way. If you were fortunate enough to manage to meet, then where would you get together to socialise? Well, probably in each other's houses, providing you weren't in lodgings, provided you didn't uh, have parents or family. And this is one such place. In fact, this is William's house, which is in Cherry Orchard, and which later, I suppose, the police would have described as the crime scene. Um, now, most men were hiding who were gay at this time. Um, and I thought that was rather depressing, perhaps inevitable, given the climate. But there were a couple of people I found out about who didn't hide, either because they chose not to or they couldn't. Um, one was a guy called Roy, and he um, lived in the flat above the piano shop at the top of Wild Cop. And he sounds like a really nice guy. I began to see him as a kind of a, a, a lighthouse in a, in a sea of grey. Uh, he lived with his partner, David, who was 20 years younger than him. Um, and I'm told by one of the old guys that he would annoyingly, perhaps, from his window, while cops give a regal wave. <laughs> which probably freaked people out totally. Um, he also was a man who had his hair permed, shock horror. He wore velvet and brocade, and he used to have lovely parties behind a, uh, a velvet curtain at the back of the piano shop, where everybody would go. So one positive person, not everybody was creeping around, but most were, I'm afraid. And the other one who wasn't particularly hiding was a young man. He was called Jeremy. And he lived in Kingsland, a nice big posh house. Um, he was age 15, and uh, he went to Eton College, where he was very flamboyant. Um, and uh, his father was later to become quite well known because he was the son of Lord Wolfenden, who was the uh, headmaster at Shrewsbury School from 1944 to 1950. Um, so, I'll come back to that later because that's quite just an interesting story if I've got time. Um, so you've got Roy and Jeremy who either could or wouldn't hide, but you have the rest of a huge, you know, 8%. That's a lot of people living in fear. It's post-war, times are changing. Um, most people, of course, wish for better times, wish for a better world. Um, a return to normality, 
but not exactly to the world, obviously, that was before the Second World War. Um, during the war, new opportunities had opened up in many ways. I've spoken to people and they talked of uh, uh, women working uh, on repairing Spitfire wheel, uh, wings in the Midlands bus garage up in uh, uh, Ditherington. Um, so women were doing things outside of what they had normally been seen as women's roles. And for people in same-sex relationships, I'm beginning to think that during the war period, there was a kind of a, a, a greater tolerance. Um, maybe, you know, they, they thought it through and realised that actually from morale points of view, it was probably better to let these relationships happen. Um, and again, if you go to the Soldiers in Love presentation later, um, I think that's very well in illustrated in, in that story. After the war, the impression I get is that tolerance went. Doors started to shut. Women were expected to return to the more traditional roles of wives and mothers and to uh, certain professions. And certainly in terms of the attitude of the state to uh, gay men, um, the, uh, the repression started again. Uh, and in fact, the prosecutions of gay men um, in the period from 1945 to 55, there's a very noticeable spike um, and great increase in arrests. And just by the way, that continued even after the 67 Act with a peak in uh, arrests and prosecutions in 1989, believe it or not. So why this fear, why this um, uh, difficulty? Well, the law was extremely repressive. I think it's very hard now for many of us, certainly for younger people, to appreciate just how ghastly the law was. Um, the law was Section 11 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1885. Um, and just to praise it, the offence that we're dealing with here is to procure the commission by another male person of an act of gross indecency, section 11 of the 1885 Act. Now, what that did was it effectively made any expression of same-sex uh, attraction a serious criminal offence. Um, the penalty, if you were caught, was up to two years in prison and until about 1898-1900, that could be with hard labour. And hard labour was, as I said yesterday, um, it's a misnomer really. Hard labour is, is torture. It's going to prison and being tortured every day, either put on a treadmill or picking what they call oakum, which is like picking rope or stuff, which makes your fingers bleed and your hands ache. So up to two years with torture daily. That's what Oscar Wilde suffered in 1895, not surprisingly, shortly after. I mean, it broke him, it killed him. Um, now, Lord Wolfenden, who I've mentioned, uh, who went on to chair the committee that ultimately made its recommendations that led ultimately to reform of the awfulness of Section 11, 1885, he described... Um, the gross indecency law is an extraordinary legis legislative accident passed without any discussion of its substance. Um, it was an amendment rushed through very quickly, no proper discussion. Uh, the Labouchere Amendment was what became Section 11. And um, Andrew Lumsden is just writing a wonderful book. I've got three of these, which if anybody wants to take away, please do. He did them for the History Festival last year. And, um, you know, I think you're bound to ask, who was Labouchere? Why? Why this absolutely appalling law that uh, caused such misery for thousands and thousands of men, their friends and families? Uh, Oscar Wilde, did make comment about uh, Section 11 and talked about whether or not it would ever be reformed. And he said that any reform, the road to reform, would be long and red with monstrous martyrdoms. And so it was. That law was not repealed until 2003. So in other words, that held until 
for about 119, 120 years. Thousands of men's lives wrecked. And just to say as well, there was actually no definition of what was gross indecency. Um, so there was no consistency. Um, it depended on the judge's view. And in fact, that got worse after 1967 because it became an offence that could be dealt with in the magistrates. So you had magistrates determining what they thought was a gross indecency. No consistent application of the law, um, depending really on the views of the chief constable of the particular area. Um, the law would be rigorously enforced or perhaps not so rigorously enforced. And one of the worst examples of that was at Manchester. Um, Anderton, who was the chief constable, um, made no bones because of his religious convictions of going out to get the queers. And it was an easy, an, an easy cop as well to catch somebody. Um, as for our police uh, constable, what I gather is that he was a reasonable modernizer. He was 32 when he became chief constable. This is <clears throat> Douglas Osmond. And um, he was for recruiting more women constables. Um, he introduced um, police radio to Shropshire and he improved the accommodation for constables. So generally he seems not too bad, but more work needs to be done there. Um, I don't know the whole story. Anyway, let's um, now get to what happened in 1949 in Shrewsbury. Just check the time for a moment. 1948, William placed an advert in Health and Strength. And Geoffrey, remember William's the 44-year-old who worked for the uh, Water Corporation, Geoffrey, the photographer in Market Street, he answered. And they met up and presumably went to William's house. William used to live there with his widowed mother and his widowed auntie. And I assume he had the place all to himself after their deaths. So he was able to have a place people could come to. March 1949, Geoffrey goes to the police with a chap called Percy. Um, and they go to the police because Percy has been assaulted. And what turns out for them, I'm sure, is not at all what they expected. And if we have time, I'll try and answer the question or give you my best idea as to why the hell did they go into the lion's den? You know, it's just... <laughs> anyway, they did. They went to the police. And this has shades of, of the Turing story. You know the, Tur the story of Turing, who was uh, a great mathematician. He'd had a chap stay the night. And um, I think this young man had burgled him. He went to the police. And the police weren't particularly interested in the burglary. And as uh, I think Peter Scott Preston said yesterday, if there was a whiff of queerdom, that's what the police were interested in. And what happens is that a whole lot of names are given of men across Shrewsbury, probably wider than that as well. And uh, many arrests are made. And on the 8th of May, William is arrested. He's uh, remanded in prison, and then he's remanded to Shelton, a psychiatric hospital. He falls apart, basically. And it, this, suddenly, this is their lives suddenly. Whew. First of June, they're in the Shrewsbury Magistrates Court, charged with gross indecency under Section 11. Um, there's a huge fallout between the different men who've been arrested. They variously say awful things about each other. Um, as I said, William's fallen to pieces. He's, uh, uh, they're, they're both uh, remanded to appear before the Assize Court, but on condition William has to return to Shelton. And there is a luridly detailed account of what they had been up to in the Shrewsbury Chronicle on the 3rd of June, 1949. Um, devastating for them, absolutely devastating. Um, 
I've not been able yet to determine what exactly was the act of gross indecency, certainly in relation to William. Uh, the person he had the gross indecency with was George, the nurse. I don't know what it was, and in a way that doesn't matter. Um, in relation to Geoffrey, the photographer, his gross indecency was in relation to Charles, the railwayman, the 20-year-old. Um, and that was that uh, he had taken photographs of Charles in his swimwear. Now, the police are reported as saying there was no particular indecency as such with the photographs. Um, but that's, that's the substance of the gross indecency. That is where Costa Coffee now is in the square. That is the, um, that is the assize court in, in uh, Shrewsbury. Apparently beautiful Grinshill building. Tragedy, it was destroyed. Um, 23rd of June, possibly a really hot Thursday morning. Um, the court is a very intimidating building. Lots of dark wood panelling. The judge is up here. William and Geoffrey are down there. It's the ninth case of the day, so Justice Hilbury is probably wanting to get his lunch. And uh, Geoffrey and William have both pleaded guilty. They haven't fought this. Again, another question, why didn't they fight? Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Justice Hilsbury, whose motto is know thyself, I think he was interested in himself. Um, speaking of Geoffrey, the photographer, he said, this man is a real danger, isn't he? And talking of both William and Geoffrey, he said, uh, they have discovered others addicted to the same practices through a magazine, Health and Strength. And he sent Geoffrey to prison for two years. Remember, this is for photographs in swimwear. And he sent William to prison for 18 months. Um, Geoffrey didn't appear to put in any mitigation at all. Uh, William did. He had a letter from a girlfriend. And um, it was noted that hopefully, in due course, um, with uh, a marriage, things would all come right. And that's the record book that it all goes down in. And there you go. William, George, gross indecency, two years, 18 months. And that wasn't all for the day. Before lunch, there were two more, two other Shrewsbury cases, and they got two years as well. And there were two others from Donington. So for a morning's work, that was quite a cull, wasn't it, really? Um, so there we go, end of the story? Well, no. Um, by this point, I'd got much better at using the microfiche in the archives. I don't know if anybody's tried to use it, but you, you kind of turn it slowly and it whoosh, really fast. And then you go really slowly and you think, oh, crisis is gonna take forever. Anyway, I got a bit better at it. And I came across a heading which said, Hill Tragedy Verdict. And this was um, in the 17th of June edition of the Shrewsbury Chronicle. And it told of a young man called Alan, who was 22, whose body was found on Care Caradoc. Um, he was a medical engineer. Uh, his body had actually been discovered on the 7th of May. Um, and he disappeared on the 30th of April. Uh, Mr. Slater, the coroner at Ludlow Coroner's Court, uh, described Alan as of being a retiring disposition with literary abilities, um, a poet of some merit, um, he had a little red diary, which was very full, but it was a very personal diary and the contents would not be revealed. Um, he was also a diabetic. And um, he did read from the suicide note. Um, Alan had written, for the first time I took a significant amount of Phoebe. And he said that he had decided to take death in its most, most seductive form. Now, there's no mention in that report of William and Geoffrey, Charles and George. But remember, they were arrested in March, 
and William had been arrested on the 8th of May. Alan's body was found on the 7th of May, so I checked back, and hey-ho, Alan's address and William's address are the same. They lived at the crime scene. So possibly Alan also answered that advert in Health and Strength. He lived in Bristol, so maybe he came to build a life here, be a medical engineer at the hospital. Um, that's partly why I call the talk falling into the arms of Phoebe as well as Salopocizes, because at the time I wrote that down and I was sure that that's what Alan had said. And when I reread and reread the reports, I couldn't find I fell into the arms of Phoebe. And I thought, blimey, that's spooky. But I thought it's the sort of thing Alan probably would have said. Anyway, what happened next? Prison? Well, this is the bit I don't know. I've not been able to find out what happened to William and his friends. I, I, I wonder, could, could William and Geoffrey have returned to the town? Could Charles and George have carried on with their jobs? I doubt it. I'd like to do more research to try and find that out. I have tried to find them, and I've had some wonderful support, but it, uh, the closest I got was one lovely woman got in touch um, when I wrote to the address that George used to live at in, in uh, Copthorne, and uh, she referred me to a neighbour who moved in in 1948. But um, that is a lady who's now very elderly, and uh, I've, I know which residential home she's in, but her daughters uh, declined to let me speak with her. So that was a shame, really, because I could have got so much more. And that's why I say, if you've got a research thing, do it now. Don't be lazy like I was and leave it. Um, Otherwise, let's see who else can we know what did happen to. Thank you. Um, I'll move quickly. Jeremy. Remember Jeremy? Yeah. Yeah, well, he was nearly expelled, age 17, at Eton, because of his uh, approaches to a first-year boy. Um, he was a very bright young man, worked for the Daily Telegraph, um, died uh, alcoholic in the 1930s in the Soviet Union. Very interesting story there. Um, one of the things he is said to have said is that his father, Lord Wolfenden, sent him a letter in 1950, so, 55 saying, you'll have probably seen from the newspapers that I am to chair a committee on homosexual offences and prostitution. I have only two requests to make of you at the moment. One, that we stay out of each other's way for the time being. Two, you wear rather less makeup. <laughs> but imagine that today, you know, the, he the headlines before, you know, Jack Wolfenden got past base would have been vice, su vice, uh, uh, vice chair's son is gay or something of that sort. Interesting question. Why didn't that happen? Because they must have known. I mean, you couldn't not know about Jeremy. Looking to the future. Ta -da! Oh, yes, that's Lord Wolfenden. If you go to the school, um, that's where his portrait is. Just nice. Um, today. Well, had they been born earlier, that could be William, Geoffrey, uh, George, Charles, and Alan. That's five young gay guys today just having a nice time out, and that's really what... Um, should have been happening then. No, I, I couldn't get a photograph of five guys in swimwear. <laughs> <laughs> I did try. Um, so yes, it's better times. They uh, have the legacy of better times. But there's just some things I would say on that. I mean, yes, we have equal criminal law now. We're equal in the criminal law. We're not quite yet, I would say, equal in the civil law. That's lesbian and gay people. Um, that's another debate. Um, I think there are all sorts of issues for people who are of my age or older. I've been told we're running out of time, so I'll go a little bit quicker. Um, if you are now needing care services, going into residential care, the history of William and Geoffrey and the others is embedded in our being. You don't just let that go because of changes of the law. And so care services really need, not just to say they have an equal ops opportunity policy or whatever, they need to demonstrate very clearly um, to people because people a bit older than me are probably still, well, I know of them, around this county are living together as friends. And what is going to happen when that friendship has to move into a residential care setting? 
think about it. Um, there is some legal redress. The Protection of Freedoms Act 2012 um, came in, which uh, said, which now means you can apply if you were charged for the sort of offence that William and Geoffrey were, for it to be disregarded, i.e. deleted from the police records. Um, however, at the time that law came in, it was estimated that 50,000 men would be eligible to make application. Um, by October of last year, 242 had applied. Only 83 had had their prosecutions disregarded, so something's not working there. Um, the other area is pardons. That's been very topical. 2013, Alan Turing was pardoned. It was a royal prerogative pardon. And um, under the recent Police and Crimes Bill, there is now pardon posthumously for everybody. So you could say, great, if William and Geoffrey are dead, then they are pardoned. But you know, what of, what of Charles and George? What of Alan? And I just wonder, should we now be thinking of the post-apartheid times? Really, a pardon to me is where you say, somebody's done something wrong, but you pardon them. Are we better to try ourselves and reconcile? And we should be pardoning people like Labouchere, who brought this beastly thing in. Yeah. And the effect of it, you imagine in every town, 8% of the population pretending to be somebody they're not, living under that fear. That's got to undermine the, the well-being of any community. Absolutely horrendous. But whether we can find it in our hearts to forgive them, that's going to take a bit of time, but that's for another debate. And I'm sorry I can't tell you quite why they went to the police, but there you go. I'll have to leave you handling with that. 